My name is Minerva Inwald and I'm a research affiliate in the Department of History in the School of Philosophical and Historical Inquiry at the University of Sydney. I'm a historian of modern China and my PhD research focused in particular on the arts and culture of China's great proletarian cultural revolution from 1966 to 1976. So today, as part of the Sophie Talks HSC series, I'm going to be talking about the Cultural Revolution. So I'm very happy to see that the Cultural Revolution has made it onto the modern history syllabus uh, for Year 12 HSC students. So today, some of the key points from the syllabus for the uh, option, the Cultural Revolution to Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square, I'm going to be talking about a few key points from that syllabus, which are the aims and methods of Mao Zedong, the role of the Red Guards, the destruction of the Four Olds, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the role of the Gang of Four. So all of these points are going to flow into each other uh, because, of course, Mao's ideology and his actions were so closely interrelated. So if we want to understand, understand Mao's aims in launching the Cultural Revolution, one place that we can start is with Mao Zedong's thought. That is, Mao's ideas about revolution, communism, socialism, culture, development, modernity. Uh, the ideas that he expressed in his body of writing, so things that he wrote from the 1920s all the way up into his death in 1976. Um, so in English, we often use the term Maoism to refer to Mao Zedong thought. Mao Zedong thought is the kind of Chinese term from the Cultural Revolution period. One great place to start if we want to learn more about Mao Zedong thought is actually with Mao's little red book. So this is a book of Mao quotations produced by the People's Liberation Army in the 1960s, right before the Cultural Revolution. It's a kind of primer of Mao's ideas, and it's a great way to get a sense of what Mao Zedong's thought and Maoism was all about. Um, and during the Cultural Revolution, the Little Red Book became almost like a Bible for the Red Guard movement. So Maoism was, of course, rooted in the uh, ideas of the 19th century German philosopher Karl Marx. Now, the thing is that Karl Marx, while he presented a theory of communism, he never actually had to lead a communist revolution, nor did he ever have to run a socialist country. So when we talk, think about Maoism, we should think of Maoism as the product of the Chinese Communist Party's own experiences, as it sought to create a socialist, uh, socialist society in China throughout the 20th century. So there's some fundamental differences between Marx's ideas and the ideas of Mao. One big difference is that Marx was not really a huge fan of the peasantry. He didn't think that the peasants were going to be an important class in the kind of revolutionary struggle. Now, the Chinese Communist Party, during the 1920s, they were pushed out of urban er areas into China's uh, rural countryside. And what that meant was that Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party relied quite heavily on China's peasantry to create their socialist revolution. And so the peasantry features quite heavily in Mao's ideas about um, revolutionary society and who are going to be the classes that lead China's socialist revolution. Marx also argued that communism would arise as the product of a particular set of economic circumstances, namely sort of developed industrial capitalism. In a classical Marxist model, all the, the economy is the base that drives all the other things in society. Uh, so for instance, the economy is what creates uh, culture and, and what creates ideology, people's ways of thinking. Now, Mao had a kind of different idea. He believed that you didn't have to wait for the right economic circumstances to launch a socialist revolution. And that, in fact, by changing people's ideology, by changing uh, the culture of China, you'd actually be able to reshape uh, the base economic model, uh, the base economic foundation of Chinese society. Um, you may have encountered some of these ideas when you studied uh, the great leap forward in the earlier part of your course. Mao also believed that class struggle continued under, under a socialist society. So even though the Chinese Communist Party had successfully won control over China and had eliminated their so-called you know, feudal and capitalist enemies and eliminated the capitalist classes and the bourgeoisie, Mao believed that these classes were still lurking, the remnants of these classes were still lurking in socialist society and could make their return at any point. So what was important is that people maintained vigilance against the rise of these particular classes and their return. Um, so in 1962, Mao announced that the Chinese people could never forget class struggle. And as the 1960s wore on, Mao even said that, the, that 
class enemies could be within the Communist Party itself. By 1966, Mao was becoming increasingly unhappy with party-led attempts to ensure that Chinese socialism was progressing along the correct revolutionary path. Now, personally, I'm of the view that senior party figures like Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping were not actively resisting Mao's line. Rather, they simply didn't anticipate the scale of the mass movement that Mao Zedong wanted to launch in order to reinvigorate the Chinese revolution. So if Mao did not have confidence in the Chinese Communist Party to implement his vision for the Cultural Revolution using its usual methods, who did Mao come to rely on to realize his vision for the Cultural Revolution? So in mid-1966, Mao dispatched some of his supporters to Beijing University campuses to stir unrest. In the summer of that year, students began to write big character posters, these handwritten bills that they pasted up all over the walls of the university criticizing their teachers. Liu Xiaoqi, who was then sort of directing party activities, decided that in order to deal with this situation, he would use a regular Communist Party method, which was uh, organizing groups of Communist Party cadres to go onto the campus in these work teams to inspect what was going on and investigate. Uh, Liu Xiaoqi's actions actually only led to sort of further unrest as students became increasingly divided, but also then began to form sort of alliances amongst themselves. Mao eventually denounced Liu Xiaoqi's actions in sending the work teams onto Beijing University campuses, saying that this had suppressed the Cultural Revolution from developing. After that point, students began to publicly form into Red Guard groups. Uh, this was the name that, that was generally used to refer to these various mass organizations formed by students. Ma with Mao's endorsement, the, the sort of slogan of the time was, it's right to rebel. And students began to run rampant in Beijing and other cities around the country, competing to implement Mao's revolutionary line and to be the most revolutionary. Mao's decision to mobilize students to implement the Cultural Revolution reflected his belief that mass movement politics could reshape Chinese society. So rather than relying on party methods, he decided to rally students together to actually make revolution on their own. Red Guard activities were fueled by the Maoist belief that what was most important was actually to change China's society, change China's culture and ideology, and to eliminate the kind of lingering capitalist, feudal, reactionary, and revisionist forces within the People's Republic. So in order to do that, and egged on by the state-run media, they began to initiate this movement to destroy the four olds, meaning old, old customs, old culture, old habits and old ideas. This included changing the names of streets so that they sounded more revolutionary, raiding people's houses and burning anything that Red Guards felt represented feudal or capitalist values, and also destroying religious sites. The movement to destroy the Four Olds brings us back to the Maoist notion that the Chinese Revolution would not only be driven forward by developing China's economy, by you know, increasing agricultural and industrial production, but also by reshaping the superstructural elements of Chinese society, namely ideology, customs, and culture. As well as seeking to wipe out any vestiges of China's capitalist and feudal culture, the Red Guards also helped Mao initiate his purge of the Chinese Communist Party itself. So basically, Red Guards began to publicly harass and humiliate senior party figures who they felt were lingering capitalist or revisionist elements within the Chinese Communist Party who were perverting Mao's view for socialist society. Um, as part of this movement, the Great Criticism Movement, they also produced newspapers and even artworks. This 1967 caricature by a student at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, Wang Rulan, depicts mockingly a kind of parade of the most senior figures in the Chinese Communist Party who were then being criticized by the Red Guards. As you can see, this artwork contributes to the Red Guard movement by criticizing these senior party figures and sort of lampooning them in this exaggerated caricature style. And we can see here two of China's most senior um, party representatives, Deng Xiaoping and Liu Xiaoqi. The actions of the Red Guards were truly unprecedented. Many of the targets of the Cultural Revolution were the most senior people in the Chinese Communist Party, who were actually really the kind of old communists who'd led the, the Communist Revolution to victory in 1949, the heroes of the Long March, the Sino-Japanese War, and the Chinese Civil War.
One of the questions that this raises is how did the Red Guards know that their activities would be sanctioned by Mao? So Mao didn't actually directly issue instructions to Red Guards. One way in which he communicated with them though was through a group known as the Central Cultural Revolution Group. This ad hoc body was created in 1966 to lead the Cultural Revolution. It was staffed mo mostly with Mao's most radical supporters, including three individuals who would later be named as members of the Gang of Four and blamed for the chaos of the Cultural Revolution. Jiang Qing, Mao's wife, Yao Wenyuan, and Jiang Chunqiao. The, Chinese the Central Cultural Revolution Group led the Cultural Revolution in this early stage, holding meetings with Red Guards to try and direct the course of the mass movement. But, as historian Morris Meisner has argued, in launching the Cultural Revolution, Mao proclaimed principles and ideals that he could not or would not sustain and unleashed social and political forces he could not control. The Red Guard movement became increasingly fractured and factionalized in 1967. The Central Cultural Revolution Group tried to encourage students to unite together, but instead students began to fight one another in incredibly bloody battles on university campuses around the country. Eventually, Mao had to send in the army to suppress the student movement. Over the following seven years, 12 million urban students, so the so-called educated youth, were dispatched to rural areas to learn from the ideological, ideologically pure peasantry and to become ordinary peasants. Many would not return to the cities for another 10 years. So Mao was successful in launching a mass movement that sought to remove all remaining elements of feudalism and capitalism lingering in Chinese society. This movement also successfully dislodged Mao's perceived enemies within the Chinese Communist Party. Although it's questionable whether figures like Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping ever really sought to undermine Mao's authority. But the chaotic methods Mao employed to rouse the Red Guards created a movement that he and his allies could not control. In the end, Mao betrayed his own commitment to mass movement politics, using the People's Liberation Army to suppress the Red Guard movement.